Now, my good friend Farron Fronchak is the next guest. She has educated and entertained us about all things American throughout the 188 editions of the Mother of All talk shows. Either she's on the show as a guest or she's watching it and commenting on it. She thinks I don't see her comments, but I do and love them. I love Farron Fronchak. I know that many of you do. Here she is on the mother of all talk shows. Farron, let's uh, talk uh, first, if we may, about the Donald Trump announcement. How was it in terms of theater? I only saw a little clip of it. Was it a successful launch or was it a kind of soft launch, a kind of more in sorrow than in anger launch? I've seen that said. You know, George, it's interesting when you remember 2016 of Donald Trump coming down the escalator. Uh, it was this grand moment. Uh, his speech was very angry, very fiery. Uh, I've, I, you know, I, when I was streaming it live last night on my own channel, um, after watching it, I want to call it the rebrand. He's it, this is like a Trump rebrand. He was very much more soft spoken than we normally see him. He was uh, very to the point on a lot of his uh, different uh, remarks that he made. You know, he talked about China. He talked about building the rest of the wall. He talked about uh, critical race theory being taught in schools and kind of touched on those social issues. Not a lot of the name calling that we're, that we're used to seeing, you know, like the little Marco and, you know, the crooked Hillary. None of that. Uh, you didn't see a lot of comedy or that feistiness. It was a much more reserved you could almost say state elder statesman uh, type of uh, vibe coming from Trump last night, which has a lot of people either really, really happy or or much, you know, like kind of or actually no, not happy. I would say confused, I think would probably be the better word. And then the, the Trump base being like, why wasn't he fiery? Why didn't he show his passion? You know, I had a journalist on with my uh, with me last night when we were streaming it who, you know, she's like, I miss the fiery Trump. I miss that guy. And I said, you know what? Here's the thing, though. His base knows who he is. This isn't a rally. It was much more statesmanlike. Again, it's he has to appeal now ever since the midterms. And we didn't see that red wave with the Republicans like they thought they would. We only saw a little bit of a ripple. He now has to win those independent moderate voters back. And this, I think, last night, uh, George, was a complete and total rebrand of, of the Trump uh, that we all kind of came to know. Well, it could have been a carefully calculated strategy of rebranding, uh, or it could be that his heart's not in it. Uh, um, and uh, maybe it's a negotiating uh, posture. After all, uh, there's been a big lobby to uh, criminalize him, to charge him uh, on one bogus uh, case after another, taking you know, pencils and rubbers home from the White House and keeping them at his <laughs> home, uh, or metaphorically at least. Uh, it may be that now, as a candidate for president, he feels that they're much less likely to serve indictments on him, make criminal charges on him, because that would indeed be a major issue for American democracy if one party was trying to imprison uh, their rival candidate. Uh, so it could be that, or it could be that he's older and wiser, uh, in which case he might not, as you've said, be able to sufficiently energize his base. What, what, what's your thinking on that? You know, as far as the older and wiser comment, I would say for your last caller probably would totally disagree with you on that one. Uh, but there are people, though, that, you know, especially many of the people around him are much different. If you remember 2016, he had Kellyanne Conway, Corey Lewandowski. These people are human pit bulls. I mean, they just went after the press. They went after candidates. They went after everybody. Um, and, and, and there was no stone unturned when it came to that primary of who they went after. Everybody got burned. Uh, now, his communications manager, uh, the, the folks that are in his team, 
it's a whole new it's a whole new chessboard here. Uh, you actually had his communications manager uh, just before the speech talking to uh, the news outlets saying, you know, you're going to see a different Trump. He's a little bit more reserved. Uh, so that's where you're going to see. Um, again, if you watch the speech last night, the only complaints that many people had is that it went on way too long. It started to get a little bit rumbly. Or, you know, he started to kind of ramble a little bit. And you actually saw the mainstream media from the likes of, well, MSNBC didn't even air it, uh, but you know the the Republican outlets they started to cut them off and and go back into regular programming. Whereas before they were there start to finish, they were even there forty five minutes before he even took the stage. It's a completely different dynamic now, and I think one of the things is you're seeing, for example, with this whole midterm election. Many of the people that were election deniers that Trump uh, propped up, most of those, if not all of those people lost their election. Where I mean, we're going to see and wait for Herschel Walker and see what happens with him as far as winning that Georgia Senate seat on December 6th. But, you know, having this idea that, OK, the economy's bad, gas prices are up. OK, Democrats are, are you know, they've totally, you know, pooped the bet on this one. We This is an easy win for us. And when voters went out and they saw, you know what? I don't know. And they didn't see that red wave. That to me shows that voters thought, you know what? I just don't believe you. I don't believe you anymore. So I'm just going to stick with who I was with in 2020. And that's where Republicans have a lot of work to do. You can sit there and talk a great game, but you got to deliver on your promises. And right now the Republicans are just known as telling you what's wrong. And yep, that's what needs to be fixed. But it's like, but how? Uh, Democrats have the same problem, too, but it's just this. The ball was in the Republican court this go around and they didn't score any great points. And with Trump, he's going to have to have to somewhat sit and deal with that and live with it. But also uh, he's known for picking horrible people around him. You know, you look at one of his first hires, John Bolton, the neocon of all neocons. People don't want that. People don't want to be involved in these wars. They're seeing how yesterday they were with the whole thing that happened with Poland, how now Congress wants to send another thirty seven point three billion over to Ukraine. More money. Americans are tired of it. And yes, he can sit and talk a great game. But at the end of the day, I think people do want some normalcy. They, they have liked a little bit of the normalcy with Biden. However, they do want somebody that's going to stand up and do something just not in the bull in the China shop type of approach anymore. Well, uh, you put your finger on one possible uh, um, clear red water that could be put between the two parties that would save the American people a lot of money and a lot of blood. Uh, I saw a tweet from Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr. this evening, in which he said, now that we know uh, that Ukraine attacked our NATO ally Poland with a missile, can we at least stop sending billions of taxpayer dollars to them? If Trump were to become the anti-war leader right now, if he were to say, enough is enough, no more money, send me, I'll fix this, I'll make sure that this doesn't get any worse, that actually could begin to build a head of steam behind him that nobody else could live with. Right. But the only thing is, though, is that people still, you know, especially on the left, they still see him as this, you know, um, bombastic, uh, you know, uncertain type of character. Now, what is interesting, what's very interesting from what I'm hearing in my Republican circles uh, in D.C., um, which the Democrat, it hasn't even hit their circles yet. They're talking about VP options, right? Uh, since he's announced, he's got it. You know, and usually you 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 announce VP options after you win the nomination. They're they're playing it as if Trump has won the nomination. They think he's going to get it, and he has a very very good chance of doing it. One of the people that's being floated for vice president that had my entire chat saying, "I will," you know what? Hands down, even if I hate Trump, I will vote for him on this one. Senator Rand Paul, son of Ron Paul. Uh, who was very beloved uh, by the American people, Senator Rand Paul making a name for himself, going up against Dr. Fauci, going up against, uh, you know, the war in Ukraine and all this money that's being sent along with Congressman Massey, uh, where they've been asking these questions over and over and over again. Uh, my chat just lit up when they saw the name Rand Paul. And that is a name that is being floated 
for the vice presidential nomination under Trump. And having somebody like that, who is known to be very anti-war, who is has that very uh, staunch American libertarianism uh, name strapped to him, and he's widely known for that, that could be the key that brings over some of those moderates that says, you know, well, I don't like Trump. At least we have a guy like Rand in there to, to, who, who will, who has stood up against Trump before, who has primaried against him in 2016. Uh, that's a name that uh, is being floated. And a lot of people immediately had excitement for that one, George. Very interesting. I'm sure they will uh, uh, now on this show also. Uh, lastly, I know you, you don't have a crystal ball, but it's not long to the Georgia runoff. Who are the runners and riders there? And what do you think the likely outcome will be? Well, I actually will be in Georgia uh, for December, on December 6th for that runoff. So if you need somebody on the ground there, I'm there. Uh, but well, it's going to be uh, will, yes. <laughs> it's going to be the uh, senator incumbent, uh, the Democrat Raphael Warnock against the Republican Herschel Walker. Now, here was the interesting thing about all of this. Um, I have a friend in the Walker campaign who said that immediately when they decided that this was going to be going to a runoff, which you have to get over uh, 50, 50 plus one um, in order to win that seat, they did not. So now the bottom candidate, which was a libertarian candidate, is thrown off the ballot, hence this special election. Uh, a lot of voters in Georgia feeling a little bit too much like, OK, I voted enough. We've dealt with this already, but they got to come out and do it one more time. Um, my friend in the Walker campaign told me that immediately the Trump campaign was called and said, don't worry about it. We got it. We're just going to we're going to have senators come in and stump for Herschel. Stay home. Just you you worry about your campaign. You do you, boo. And <laughs> the, the Trump team was like, OK, it's one less thing for us to do. And then the Ron DeSantis team was called and said, hey, you want to come on the campaign trail and campaign with Herschel Walker for the next three weeks? And it looks like DeSantis is going to be going. Uh, you got Ted Cruz, you got Mitch McConnell, you got, you know, the usual suspects, Rick Scott, um, you go, you got all these other Republicans that are going down there. I think uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Trump already knows, but when he That's sees quite it high in risk, action, though, Farhan. yeah, <laughs> it's a very yeah, high risk. Thing. High risk. I mean, World War uh, Three. there's the, another if one. If DeSantis <laughs> spends three weeks there and they don't win, uh, then Trump will say, look, that was because you kept me out of the campaign and look how popular DeSantis is. He's nothing without me. I mean, I could write that for Trump right now. Right, exactly. And that's where they do think, though, with his with DeSantis's star power, as far as when it comes to your local governorship, you know, like that that local guy, you know, he's not he's nationally known, but he's more of a local governor um, having that star power and then being just one state over. Uh, they think that that's going to actually help drive people out to the polls uh, because Herschel Walker, you know, he was one of the greatest running backs of all time, probably not one of the greatest politicians, you know, and so he's going to need a little bit of help to get over that hump. However, if you have all these other Republicans to get, to get, that are throwing the ball. Exactly. Yeah. He's going to need some help to get the ball over the line. line. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, the, that's the thing show, is, is you if you have these other Republicans. You need to explain to me and the British audience and Europeans what a running back is. Farhan Fronchak, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> the guy who takes all the hits, George. The guy who the takes all the hits. Of all talks. <laughs>